today on Unpacked. Mm. So he's like, we've decided to let you go. There's no better way to say this. Mm. At that point, I was now a single mom. And I remember going online and looking for shelters. And I was literally typing that search with tears mm. in my eyes. And is that when your life started that to was turn it. around? Yeah, that was the turning point for me. Mm -hmm. Having someone sponsored, having someone believe in me. I remember I broke into tears in his office, like literally crying. Mm -hmm. Picking yourself up after being retrenched. Today's guest is here to share her story. Let's unpack. Nikki Verd is a speaker and author whose life spiraled out of control after she was retrenched from her job. The mother of two hit rock bottom as she struggled to make ends meet. But through all the challenges, she managed to rise above it. This is her story. Let's unpack. Nikki, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Take me back to the time where uh, you were working. Tell us about what your career was all about and what you were doing. Um, back in the day, I actually was working in retail, mm. but I wanted something more. And so... So retail was your first job? Yes, like a cashier at mm. the retail store. Mm. But I always had a hunger for more. Mm. And I was like, what can I do? And so I remember back then thinking if perhaps I could go back to school, maybe you can open more doors for me. Mm. And so I enrolled and I started doing a diploma. And then halfway or so, not even up to halfway, a year or so into mm. my diploma, I started um, applying for jobs outside of what I was doing. And mm. I thought I was taking a huge, a huge uh, risk because I thought, I don't know if anyone would pay attention to me. I don't have any experience, mm. so to say. And um, qualification in terms of education-wise, I also felt like I was lacking. But mm. nonetheless, I was like, I'm going to try. So I started applying for, for positions in admin in different companies. And mm. I applied a whole lot. It took me, I think, almost a year to finally get a job. Mm. And so when that time came, I went for a couple of interviews, so many of them that I never really got a second call or anything like that. But when that final job came, I was like, wow, finally I did it. Mm. So I got a job as a personal assistant for a doctor and I was mm. very excited. I signed a permanent contract of employment. I was mm. like, my life is set. Yes. This is time to start climbing the corporate ladder, right? Like, and, and basically so. the retail was... Um, almost like you were not permanent there. They called you as and when they needed you. Um, it wasn't even like that. It, was, it wasn't even like they called me when they needed me. It was something like I could be there if I wanted. I could mm. leave if I wanted. It wasn't like the big retail you're probably having in your head. It was mm. like small retail businesses yes. around town here and yes, there where you could, you. yeah. You, so you talk to the owner and they're like, okay, you can come work for us as a, mm. as, as a cashier. So mm. it wasn't like anything with where you sign a contract, like you're mm. working here or anything like that. So even when it came to the time to give references at the, with the jobs I was applying, mm. it was a struggle because I had no references to I give. I understand. Yeah, mm. so, but finally I got a job as a personal assistant. It was my first real job in the corporate world, as I can mm. put it, and I was beyond excited. And so, how old were you at that time? Um, maybe 28. I can't remember exactly mm. what my mm. age was. Mm. I've already had my two kids yes. at the time, though. Yes. So um, all I knew while I was doing retail was mm, be a mom. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, and a wife at the time. I'm sure we'll get to that part. So... Uh, when I got the job, I was very excited. I was like, finally, I finally got my foot in the door. You know, mm. it was like the beginning of it. So I had plans to study, you know, from the diploma to get mm. a degree, get a master's, get PhDs. These were thoughts in my head. Mm. I wanted it all. I was like, this is it. So I'm mm. going to get, you know, as far as I can. And so I signed a permanent uh, contract of employment. And my, my boss would, from time to time, we would have conversations like five years ahead of what mm. he was thinking we would do together. And so in my head, it registered in my head that, I had time here. so And this is long term. This is long term. Mm. And so I was so into it. And I, my mind, they would, like some people would talk about plan B or whatever, mm. right? 
there was nothing like plan B. I was, this is it. <laughs> this is it. So, and at that time, what were your, um, let me say, when your boss is saying to you, this is the, what's going to happen in five years, what ambitions did you have for yourself in that job in terms of growing? Uh, my ambitions were to, one, further my education, go mm. further in education. I personally did not think that maybe five years would be with me in that same uh, working with the same uh, organization that I was mm. because I didn't see how I could even move being mm. a personal assistant. But I thought if I could go, you know, further my education, then I can be able to maybe three years down the line or four years down the line or even the five years down the line, mm. I could then start applying for different positions yes. outside of admin. Yes. That was the plan, you know. Um, I wanted something in marketing. Mm. And so those were the plans which never materialized somehow. But mm. those are the things that I had in my mind as ambitions to mm. further my education, get something in marketing and, yeah. So now you were saying the boss is sharing with you five-year goals. In your mind, you're like, wow, I'm yeah. set. I don't need a plan B. Absolutely. What's the next thing that happens? So one morning I went to work and I used to work very much alone. My boss was like someone who would be around a lot. So he travels a lot. And mm. so I used to like work on my own. And each time he would come back from his trips, then I would have to like we'll run meetings where I will update and bring mm. him up to speed with what has been happening or we'll have phone conversations and things like that. So one day he came in and he called me in for a meeting. And in my mind, it was one of those meetings to catch up, like, mm. okay, time to bring the boss up to mm. speed. But when I went in and sat down, the look on his face that morning was different. I was mm. like, in my head, I'm thinking, like, what have I done? Mm. But I was like, okay, I'm going to brave it. So I sat with a brave face. And for some time, maybe what felt like eternity was probably like 20 seconds or so mm. for him to say something. And I could feel my heart pounding out of my chest mm. because I knew this is not the normal conversations we usually mm. have. My boss was someone who is very energetic. Mm. As he'll start talking to you while you're still coming through the door and having mm. to get a seat. But this is me sitting down and this man is just looking at me like, mm. what's going on? Um, but anyway, after taking a deep breath, which felt like he took my soul along, yes. right? So he told me uh, we've been... There, there are changes that have been happening within the organization mm. and there have been like some restructuring going on and they've been wondering what to tell me. And I'm thinking like, what are you telling me? Mm. So he's like, we've decided to let you go. There's no better way to say this. Mm. And I was like, no. From then on, whatever conversation he carried on, it did not register. All I you knew was that. You couldn't hear anything. I just mm. heard that they're letting me go. And I just sat there and he finished talking and I'm just thinking in my head that this man just carried on talking like this is a normal conversation. Mm. Like you just ripped my world apart and mm. carried on with the conversation, right? So anyway, by the end of that day, I was jobless. So I had a... Did he explain to you that it was with immediate effect? Like what, did, what were the details around what was going to be happening in terms of you being let go? I had a month, he said, from now on. Mm. That was my last month, so which mm. was like a couple of weeks to go. Mm. So he said that at the end of the month, I would, that would be my last mm. to be, you know, to be working with them. And he, he, he was very empathetic. He's like, you know, start applying. Mm. Um, I will write for you recommendation letters. I'd worked with him up to that point for two years. Mm. So I will write recommendation letters and I will help you any way I can. But mm. at this point, we cannot keep you. Mm. So when I left home, when I left and went home that day, I don't even remember how I drove home that day. Mm. And I still had to be back at work the next day. So mm. the remaining three weeks, I was literally like a walking zombie. Mm. I didn't tell anybody that I'd been retrained. <laughs> Not wow. even my best friend. I told no one that I'd been retrained. I was just trying to make sense of it. Mm. And the pain was unbearable. Like, mm. But as time went on, what, what did it represent to you that, um, I mean, obviously... The most obvious thing is the fact that loss of income. Yeah. But what was the most painful thing about what that moment meant to you? The most painful thing for me was the fact that 
I was not even thinking about what I would call a plan B, right? If something mm. like this happens, what can I do? So I had no other... I didn't think of how can I move on from here? Mm. You know, like, this is my first real job in corporate, and this for me was going to be like a stepping stone, you know, to, to get to other places that I'd planned, use the money from there to further my education. I think that was mm. one of the big blows. I was like, how do I even get on with mm. the diploma I was trying to get, right? So beside the income, it was just the, the, the shattering of this dream to have an education, mm. which was something I always wanted, but my family could not, back in the days when I was still much younger, mm. put me through, they couldn't afford to put me through varsity. Mm. And so even while growing up into my 20s, I had like that deep sense of something is lacking mm. if you don't have a degree and things like that. So I was like, so finally, I'm not even going to be able to get this thing I've been mm. wanting to get. So that was my personal thing that I wanted to maybe just yeah. to satisfy myself that I went to school, I have the degree and mm. all of that. So the, me losing the job was like losing that mm. losing thing as dream well. That you losing that dream as well. Yeah. yeah. So beside the income, that was one, one of the painful mm. experiences of it. Then secondly, as at that point, I was now a single mom. Okay, mm. how do I even take care of these two children? And I remember feeling so angry. Like if there was anybody who should not lose a job, it's me. Yeah. It was literally one year after my divorce, like exactly one year after my divorce that I lose, I lost my job. Mm. And so the pain of having to even explain to the kids what's happening and then now losing my job. So it was a bit too much. I was still mm. making sense of it. There was so much pain that I was still going through, mm. you know, just from the divorce alone. And then this mm. happens. And so I remember feeling very angry. I think angry is not even the, the, the right word. I was like, oh, and I felt like, am I, am I not too young to be retrenched? I know that's a naive thought now when I think about it. But I was like, shouldn't retrenchment be for all the people mm. who have worked for 20, 30 years, and they've mm. been in this corporate thing forever. Why is anyone thinking of retrenching me when I'm just trying to get in, you mm. know? So that just escalated my emotions. But now I realize this thing can happen to anyone, you know? And I was like, I think I have a few people in mind that could have been retrenched, you know? And I thought mm. of A, B, C, or <laughs> But still, they had their job. I know that was a stupid way of thinking. But nonetheless, I was very... Um, there were so many emotions running through me and I was asking myself a lot of questions. But one thing in the midst of all of that that I think I was very clear about is that I don't want to feel this pain anymore. Mm. I don't want this type of disappointment where I am not in control of my life. Mm. And so I remember thinking very clearly that even though my boss had asked me to apply and he would see how he can help me in writing recommendation letters and mm. things like that. I was, at that moment, I was like, I'm not applying for any corporate jobs. Wow. And somebody watching would be thinking, yeah, that they might have been doing it from the day they found out yeah. to be like, I need yeah. something now. Yeah. So yeah. what made you decide you're not going to apply? At the time, it was that just that pain. I'm like, I'm going to go through this again if I apply, probably. Mm. So I was like, I'm not going to go through this. And I remember lying to my mom mm. <laughs> each time she would ask if I was applying for jobs. Mm. I'd be like, yeah, I'm applying, but you know, it's hard. Mm. It's hard to get a job. And I never applied, maybe except one. Mm. And so every time she would ask, how is the job search going? I'm like, mm. I'm trying. We'll mm. see how it goes. Mm. So I literally, uh, how that mindset shift even came about is something that, for me, this is something I always wanted. Mm. And I had plans to work and study up to PhD. That was the dream I thought I wanted. Mm. But I realized now when it happened, like, I'm not in control of this. I could even have the PhD mm. and someone can decide that we, we no longer would want you. We no longer need you. Mm. I mean, you went through a whole month of knowing that you're going to lose your job. And then the job is gone, which means your routine changes. What was it that you lost? What was it in your life that you struggled with? Yeah, a lot of things. There was a lot of hopelessness. And to be honest, I was depressed. And after 
it was now clear that there is no job for me. I remember the one thing that I had was the car that I was using at the time. It was a very small car. And I sold it uh, probably for around 30000 if mm. I remember correctly. And there was something happening in South Africa at the time, which was like uh, um, uh, this word for it I'm looking for. Um, where you put money and then some the, your money grows back. I can't find like the word for an it right investment? now. It's some sort of an investment opportunity. Yes. And a bulk of that money went into that because I was hoping... Mm. that I can grow money yeah. in, in that way. Now looking back, it was the worst decision I could have taken. So the big part of the money from selling the car went into that. I sort of invested mm. into, into that. It, but a uh, uh, few months later, I realized it was a scheme. You know, the money is gone. <gasps> so you lost it. Yes, I, 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 lost the, I lost most of the money that I sold mm. the car. And so the money was gone. And now with two kids without a job, things were very difficult. You know, but before I could run completely dry, I decided I'm going to look for other ways I could I could make money. You mm. know, there were there were days that literally, okay, when this happened and I lost the money, I remember I have two kids, so my daughter and my son. I had to talk to a lady who was like a mom to me at that mm. time and ask if she could take in my son because mm. I couldn't handle both of them. Mm. And so my son went to live with her yeah. for a year and I stayed with my daughter. Mm. But even with my daughter, it was still very difficult to even feed her. I remember there were days um, <laughs> I would literally have to reuse one tea bag. Like mm. I used like put in hot water a little bit, I take it out <laughs> mm. because I would still have to reuse it for her the next day just for her to have tea. And so things were looking very bleak. I was like, mm -hmm. how am I ever going to get out of here? And so I thought of maybe I can try selling something on the street. And I remember just going to mm -hmm. Johannesburg CBD and just asking random people selling on the street, like, how did you get this spot you're using mm -hmm. here? How can I get one? Maybe I can look for things to sell on the street and things like that. And so after a couple of visits there, um, I finally got a place. It probably took a month or so for me to find a place there. Mm. But when I found a place, I was like selling a few accessories, jewelries here mm. and there. There was a point where I started selling food as well. But it was very time consuming and time demanding. Even having that place, I was unable to still sustain myself financially. Because with accessories, me being a first time a day, I don't have a customer base. People don't know me. So, and I just, I was just grateful for one thing that I had a very understanding landlord mm. who did not throw me out. Mm. And I when remember, you were unable to pay. Yes, yes. when I was unable to pay. And I remember him asking me, don't you have any family you may perhaps move in with them? Mm. I was like, no. Though I had some people I could consider family, but, and there was one person actually that offered now that you've lost your job, move in with us, like a family friend, him mm. and his wife, right? Mm. Move in with us and get back on your feet. Mm. And I said no. My reasons for saying no is that I thought that that offer was going to make me comfortable. Mm. I would get them in the morning, they have food in their fridge. You know, my daughter would not have to go hungry. And I felt like it will not push me mm. to do what I wanted to do. Secondly, it is one of the most valuable relationships that I had in my life at mm. the time and even up to now. And I thought us getting into one space might bring mm. frictions that might ruin the relationship. Mm. So I also wanted to protect that relationship. Even though I'd never explained all of these mm. to him, I just said, no, I'll figure something out. But at the back of the, my mind, I hope he watches this now. Yes. He's gonna know why I said no. But I was like, no. You know, mm. I'm going to figure something out. And I remember him threatening me one day that he's, he knows how to get me to move in with him. He's just going to come get the kids. Yes. <laughs> and then and I'll be forced come. Yeah, to, to, to come. I was like, no, I'll figure something out. Mm. And that was when the figuring something out now got me into the streets and I had to start mm. selling things on the street. And it still got so bad because not money was coming to sustain mm. us. My landlord has said, okay, um, I can do what I'm trying to do, get back on my feet. The, they're not going to put me on uh, so much pressure for the rent and things like that. I can mm. pay whenever I, I have the money. Mm. I'm glad that up to that point, 
um, I've never had an issue with my landlord where mm. I was renting. So they were like, we've seen you. The first thing for you is ever to pay your rent when you were working. Mm. We've never had issues. And so it will be cold-hearted for us to kick mm. you out mm. in, under these circumstances. So they kept me. And I kept trying to make ends meet. Mm. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was difficult. I remember... Going for, a friend invited me for a birthday party. <laughs> His, uh, her child birthday party mm. and asked me to bring my daughter for the party. And I brought my daughter and when we walked in, she saw a lot of chicken mm. on the table, you know, and mm. she jumped like, mommy, meat. I literally had to put my hand on her mouth like, Shame. it's so loud. Shame. Oh. Because that was something we were like, kind of not used to, mm. you know. And because for us, it was literally like whatever can get into the stomach and don't come back, oh, we're fine with it. You know, mm. food wasn't anything fancy. Meat was not something that we ate so often of it. We just do veggies. Because meat is cabbage. expensive. Tell yeah. me about it. And the reality is at the time, um, I mean, you're painting this picture of an absolute struggle after you were getting ready to yeah. start climbing the corporate ladder. Yeah. You get on to selling things on the street and sometimes you might not even sell a thing for a day yeah. and go home with nothing. Mm -hmm. um, at what point did you then jump on to, okay, I can do this differently. I can jump online and I can pick myself up. Yeah, there was a time that the street became very demanding yes. and, and very exhausting, mm. not only physically, but emotionally and mm. mentally as well. Uh, there are other things I wanted to do, but there was no time, not even ta enough time for me to be a mom, you know. Mm. So, and I remember when the street got very rough and I, I realized that there are people on the street here telling me stories. They've been there for five years, 10 years. Mm. I was I don't want to be that person. One person told me they've been there for 25 years and it scared me. I was like, I don't want to be on the street for this long. So mm. I have to figure something out. And I started trying to learn how to do something I saw on the streets, the, the um, African jewelry, which mm. is like beaded work you mm. do with beads. So I did a few Google search and I got to some YouTube videos and I watched them and I learned how to do those things. Mm. I bought the materials and so I would learn how to do those things from watching those YouTube videos. But before I even got to that, there was a point I went back to the person who had offered me accommodation. Mm. I was like... Is that offer still open? Oh. <laughs> I'm just checking to be sure that if things get really worse, you still mm. accept me and the kids. It's like, come on, silly. The house is open. Mm. Anytime you feel like coming in, you can come in, you know. And there were friends that supported me. I don't want to even sit here and act like everything was from my struggle that I was able to even have the food to mm. eat, you know. Sometimes there was no nothing coming from the street. So there were friends that would support me. And mainly the big part that sustained me and the kid, as far as food goes, was the church in which I was at the time. Mm. They were giving food parcels mm. to people that were struggling. Mm. And every Sunday I would stand on that queue and I would mm. get food parcels. I know that would take us from that Sunday mm. till the next Sunday. So I just became a thing where you're not like excited to go and pray, you're excited to go and get food. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. You're excited to go and get food. And so that was my life for, for some time while I'm trying to figure things out and all of that. And I ask um, uh, my friend, like a family friend, like if the offer was still open, like, of course you can come in any time. But it's a relationship I never wanted to lose. Mm. And I was like, this would be too much. What if I go and messed up, you know? Mm. What if something happens? Um, and secondly, it, it would not motivate me to find things mm. to do with my life. I would just sit there, there's food and everything. And I did not want to go through that. And I remember my landlord at some point when I was behind like six months in rent. Mm. And he asked me, like, they, they don't think they can continue to carry me mm. with this. And I remember going online and looking for shelters, mm. typing, like, shelters around me where they can mm. maybe take in a mom and a child. And I was literally typing that search with tears mm. in my eyes. You know, I was like, wow, there's no other way out. And I spoke to my family back home about it. They asked me to send the kids home. I was like, I grew up without a mom. I don't want the same for my children. So I was like, no. Mm. And for them, 
I'm being stubborn. I was like, these kids are too young. They're still trying to even understand why they're not with their father. And I didn't have to also separate them away from me. It's like, if we're going to live on the street, we live on the street. The lady that I asked him to take my daughter was just like around, like mm. a few, two hours or so away from me. And I was like, I prefer my son to be there. I can see him, you know, once in a month or so, or mm. twice a month, rather than fly him across country to mm. another different country. Like, I was like, I was not comfortable mm. with that. And so my family thought that I was being very stubborn. But I know, I knew the emotional damage mm. that would do to my kids. And it's a difficult decision to have to make as a parent. It because is. on the one hand, is you're choosing between your child being provided for a certain way versus your child being able to be with their parent. Absolutely. So fast forward to what was the turning point in this whole challenging time you went through? As time went on, all the frustration I was feeling, the confusion and all of that, it kind of transformed into curiosity when I started asking questions like, but what is driving retrenchment? You know, and I remember it's like when you buy... Um, a car, a particular mm. Mac of a car, mm. you start seeing that particular Mac mm. everywhere, you know, and it's not only with cars, it could be maybe a particular set of jewelries, you never saw them yes. before, now you buy, like with my watch, now I see it everywhere. So I was like, okay, apparently the retrenchment thing is happening because each time I turn on the TV now, I will hear news about retrenchment, news that never jumped on me before. Mm. When I turn on the radio, I will hear news about retrenchment. I was like, this mm. thing is... It didn't just happen to me. It seems like a lot of people, you know, yes. there were mining companies that were re retrenching so many people. Back in 2016, I know that the, the, the pandemic has escalated a lot of retrenchment mm. this time around. Mm. But even back in 2016, it was just for me, like it kept jumping on me, yes. you know. And I was like, oh, this thing is, did not just happen to me. Apparently, it seems like a lot of people are going mm. through it. But then uh, I wanted the curiosity that my pain transformed into was like, but what is driving so much retrenchment? Mm. How can an organization let go for some companies at the time? I would hear where there were like 2,000, 3,000 employees being let go in this space of like two, three years. Mm. I'm like, how can an organization let go so many people mm. and they continue to thrive? When the, the, the profits increases, like efficiency, like everything mm. just seems normal. Mm. What keeps them going yes. if so many people leave? And that was a question I wanted to know and I find an answer to. And so I threw myself in the belly of the internet. And I kept researching and I started researching what drives these organizations, mm -hmm. you know, what keeps them afloat? Why is retrenchment so rampant? And for the first time, um, concepts or words like artificial intelligence started mm -hmm. jumping on me. Uh, robotics, mm. automation, um, these new technologies that are coming up now it started jumping on me. The whole mm. fourth industrial revolution, as I can put it, jumped on me. And up to that point, the only technology that I could say I knew mm. was to sit on my laptop, mm. <laughs> work, send emails, or use my phone to make calls. Yes, that was the yes. only technology I was exposed to. And I was like, what is this? What is artificial mm. intelligence? It sounded to me like a foreign language. Mm. I was like, the fourth industrial revolution, what is that? If there's a fourth, it definitely means there was a third, there was mm. a second, there was mm. a first. And so I went all the way back. I'm like, mm. I'm going to understand what this thing is. So the more I was researching, I became very intrigued mm. by the whole concept of how technology is changing mm. work. You know, with my curiosity now of what is driving retrenchment, so for the first time I realized work jobs that were being done by humans mm -hmm. are now being replaced with machines, mm. certain re re routine work and things like that. Machines are replacing these people when they leave an organization yes. in their numbers. I was very fascinated by, by that. I was like, wow, this is an information I didn't know. Right up to 2016, I was like, have I been living under a rock? So, so what did you conclude after reading all of that and coming to the realization of what happens when people are getting retrenched but companies are still thriving? So as I initially, my plan was just to satisfy my curiosity. I just yes. wanted to like, okay, I need to know what's going on here. But now when I throw myself on the internet, the information got really intriguing and I couldn't stop mm. digging more into finding out what was happening, right? Like I'm saying, the moment I started 
coming across the fourth industrial revolution mm. over and over, I was like, okay, I'm going to find out what the third was about, mm. what the second was about, what the first was about, and how the journey got to the fourth, where we are right now. So, and secondly, remember, there's no job for me. Mm. So this became like an escape. Yes. To escape my pain, some sort of therapy. I'm like, okay, I'm going to write about this as well. So mm. the findings I was finding on the internet, I started putting on social media, mm. uh, which now when I look back, it was more like testing my ideas mm. to see how people receive it. Mm. But at the time, I didn't know I was testing it for me. I, I just wanted something to replace the yes. confusion, the pain I was feeling and all of that. So I started writing. Writing became an escape for me. But the more I was putting this information on social media, the more I realized that I was not the only clueless person about how technology is changing the world. Mm. People I thought that were even, you know, in the tech space, people that were in, have uh, had like IT backgrounds, mm. they started asking me questions as though I was the expert. <laughs> I was yes. like, it gave me some sort of comfort that I was not the only clueless person, yes. right? But I was like, so even this person didn't know, they're mm. asking me, I should be asking yes. you. I was like, okay, this is quite interesting. So from putting on those social media posts, which got a lot of engagement and traction, mm. I then started blogging about it, like writing mm. now articles about it. And at one point I started thinking, you know, somebody needs to write a book mm. about this. And at the back of my mind, I did not think that someone would be me, you know? And it became like when an idea has gotten hold of you, if you don't do it, you become miserable. Mm. And I was like, I cannot possibly write a book. I'm not that smart. Mm. I don't, I'm not an academician by any stretch mm. of imagination. I cannot write a book. So I, I talked myself out of writing the book. But as time went and I realized that, because I'm being so intrigued with this whole research that I have been doing, maybe I should just do it. And so I gave in, I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this. And so it evolved from the social media post, from me blogging, writing mm. blog articles about it, then it evolved into a book. Mm. You know, which I titled Disrupt Yourself or Be Disrupted because I was like, I was at work minding my own business and someone disrupted my life. So mm. I wanted people to start having, or us to start having these conversations around how technology is changing the world and how, you know, people are losing their jobs and people should start thinking, what if I lose my job, you know? Mm. So even when I finally put the book together, mm. And being without a job, without an income, it was not, it was, I was barely feeding myself. I was mm. living on a shoestring budget. So I was barely feeding myself. So how do I even publish this book? Mm. So I started writing letters to corporate. I wrote to so many <laughs> uh, sponsorship letters. Mm. All, all the doors that I knocked at were just closed on my face. Like, we don't do books, you know, we, we sponsor mm. events and things like that. We don't mm. do books, sorry, we don't do books. And there was a time I thought like, Maybe I should just forget about this dream of writing this book. First mm. of all, I told myself I cannot write a book, and now I was here trying to prove that. <laughs> you know, I could, so I went back on the whole self-fulfilling prophecy thing. I was like, I knew this thing was not going to work. Mm. So I was at a, at a point of giving up when one morning I'm sitting and watching TV <laughs> in my room, and someone popped on TV, and the interview they were doing on this guy was so in line with, what I've been what I've been talking about all oh, just resonated with me on a deeper level. Mm. And I was like, who is this person? I've never known, I've never come across the person anyway. But I quickly took the name on Google. And I remember calling the office. I got the office number and called and asked if I could speak to this person. My intention was that if I could get because some sort of like really an influential person, mm. if I can get an influential person to write a foreword for my mm. book, people may pay attention to that, you mm. know. So I was like, I'm just going to ask him if he can write a foreword. Though someone I've never mm. met, I just watch him on TV. I'll tell him how I came across him and all of that. So I, I called the office, spoke to the PA. The PA told me he's on holiday. You cannot mm. talk to me right now. It took for me like a month or two months or so. I got back on the office calling and again and finally they booked a meeting with me mm. and, and this person. And so when I walked into his office uh, that day, I told him my story and what I've been struggling to do and the book, what it's all about. It's like, this is very relevant for the times in which we're living. By the way, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to write a foreword for you. Mm. And when is the book coming out? I was like, 
I don't know. Mm. Like, what do you mean you don't know? You mean it's not at the publishers yet? I was like, no, it's not. Be uh, then he kept asking why. I was like, because um, the finances to, I'm still mm. working on that, you know. And then he asked me how much. By that time, I had spoken with my, someone had introduced me to a publisher and they mm. actually given me a quote because I was trying to see what do I do. And I had launched, um, it's called crowdfunding campaign. I think where you, a particular website where you yes. put your things and are you asking people like the general Donate. public mm. for donations. So I was running that. You were supposed to run for 30 days. It was like in the middle of it and like basically like I wasn't even halfway through mm. one quarter of what they requested, you know, for, for me to be able to even get something out of that. I was nowhere close. So I explained to him that I'm trying to raise money at that, to that point. And because he started becoming very intrigued into that, the, the campaign that I was running, I started feeling so happy in my heart that maybe he would put something towards the, the campaign. Oh, he's like, okay, that's what you're trying to do to, to, to publish the book? I said, yes. Then he asked me, how much is the total cost of mm. the book? I was very afraid to even voice the amount of money that my publisher had given me, you know? I was like, because this is self-publishing, I was like a first-time author, I'm thinking, Nobody in the publishing, the traditional publishing industry will even pay attention to me. So I, my mm. best option was to self-publish. So I told, uh, I wasn't comfortable to tell him the amount. So he literally dragged the amount mm. off of my mind. Like, come on, tell me. And I was like, but I don't know you, sir. Like, tell me, how much is it going to cost? I think this is very relevant. So I told him and he said, tell your publisher to send me the invoice. And how much was it? 85000 And he just decided to pay for you? Yeah. So you published your first book. Yeah. And is that when your life started that was to turn it. around? Yeah, that was the turning point for me. Mm -hmm. Having someone sponsored, having someone believe in me. I remember I broke into tears in his office, like literally crying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like, but so you don't know me. Mm -hmm. He's like, this 15 minutes with you tells me that you are someone worth investing in. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, things turned around for me from that moment. How did the business grow from then? And so when the book came out, it took, like eight months or so to the final publication of the book. And when the book came out, being a first time author, I was still not very sure of how the market would receive my book, right? So I started going to like talk to the, 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 the book distributors around the country. You know, I mm. called in and they, they were like, you need an agent, you know, mm. to, to, to get into national bookstores and mm. things like that. And I was like, okay, I did try. I, I spoke to some agents and even my publisher offered to be the agent that can mm. distribute the book for me. But then when I was looking at the percentage that I would get at the end of the day, I was like, this is it's a very little waste money. of time. Yes. So I'm going to take matters into my own hands and try my own luck. So after all the agents and what I was supposed to end with was too little for me, I'm like, I'm going to try and see how I can do this on my own. One was to use social media, that was my plan, and to try and see if I could get into the bookstores without the help of any agent. Mm. And so every bookstore that I knocked, they told me, you need an agent. I, but I kept knocking. I was like, yeah, I know you've told me. Then there was a particular turning point, the lady that I've been calling over and over and mm. over and over, she told me, you know what, you are very persistent, but this is what I can do for you. Take the book, to a couple of our stores, speak to the store mm. managers, let them see the book, then give me feedback mm. of what they have said about the book. So I took the book, the, the physical um, print of the mm. book, and I went to a few store managers. I spoke to them like, this is, this is great. When did you publish this? I remember one person actually telling me that this can sit on even an international book mm. shelf, you know, so it shouldn't be an issue for it, for it to get to their bookstores, like what, what did they say at the head office? I'm like, they told me they will need feedback from a few managers before they can take it in. So uh, f fast forward to the point where now the book is out. Yeah. The book is doing well. Yeah. What did you do to build your business? What was the business that you built? The business was as be, being an author mm. and, 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 and a speaker because now that the book has, the book came out and a lot of people were very intrigued about how technology is changing the world. Mm. So I started getting like, as I was very active on social media, even while the things were really bad for me, I was like building an audience on mm. social media. So there were a lot of people talking about, talking about the book. So it became now to the point where I was being invited to speak mm. about what I had written. So I wasn't just now like someone who had published a book. I was now doing like speaking, I can call mm. it like a professional level. And I remember... 
before the, the, the pandemic happened, the, my book actually took me to um, Botswana. It mm. took me to Nairobi, Kenya. Mm -hmm. It took me to Rwanda. Mm. And before the pandemic actually became something that we had to be on lockdown, I had yes. a couple of international trips that I was supposed to do, you know, because mm. to speak on these the fourth industrial revolution, the future of work, and how mm. people can prepare themselves, you know, mentally for the changes that are happening at work. So what I, what I absolutely love about uh, where you have come from is the fact that you just did this on your own, going to, you know, you yeah. didn't have to have a degree or anything. Yeah, yeah. You found an interest in something and um, you took that and created something with it. And you're so fortunate that in the midst of struggling with your children, struggling to make ends meet, you met somebody that was willing to take a chance on you. So what is the biggest lesson that, you know, now that you look back at your retrenchment, what was the biggest lesson? What was the biggest gift from you being retrenched? For me, the biggest gift, it's not even that I wrote a book, it's the person I had to become. Mm you know, mentally, emotionally, and just the way I see the world. Mm. Me thinking that I had no life or I had no chance at life without mm. a degree, it was all false. Now mm. I realize I know better. So with that shift in mindset for me, that is the big, biggest thing that came as, mm. as a result of retrenchment. Because I think if I stayed in the corporate world, I would have continued trying to climb the corporate ladder and acquiring these certificates, which some are relevant, most of them are not relevant for the mm. world in which we are living. So I would have just found myself in trapped, so mm. to say. And so I'm glad that I, I did not get trapped. Somehow I'm open now to do whatever mm. I want to do. Secondly, I never knew there was a writer in me. That's mm. why when the idea to write a book came, I completely cancelled it. Mm. I bind it. I tear it apart. I was like, not me. Mm. How on earth am I going to write a book? Mm. You know, like I can barely speak English. How can anybody ask me to mm. write a book? So those were my thoughts then to realize that the very things I thought I couldn't do, I can actually do them. Mm. So that for me is the biggest thing that came from the retrenchment that uh, there was so much with, inside of me that I did not know mm. until the retrenchment happened. What I admire most about your story is that it really does give hope. Much as your retrenchment happened pre-COVID times, uh, many people that are watching lost their jobs during this pandemic. Uh, many businesses didn't survive. And I think that this is such an opportunity for people to find hope that you really can create a life for yourself out of seemingly nothing. And as you rightly said, that there's so many things about yourself you didn't know, you didn't believe, and now you're doing them. You're an author, you're a speaker, you're being booked to speak internationally. And for that, I'm, I'm so grateful that you were able to come here and to share your story. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. There really is hope in some of these absolutely dire situations that one can find themselves trying to sell things on the street or looking for a shelter to live in to later turn out to be an author and a speaker having created a whole life for themselves. So I hope that's the one thing you take away from this episode, that it doesn't matter where you are, it doesn't matter what you have, anything is possible. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a good night. Next time on Unpacked. Everybody knows you guys as the KFC couple. At that time, we could like a trend that in a size would see when the more trend goes a gala and yellow sauce cards. Oh, go near Gaku, go to Kaku Spag and that. Kanga Muti, Oma best term, it says this, Dorebeti, just name it. It wasn't just we're going to give you a wedding. Yes. They said name yes. anything. After it, they do a name one Zaga Chanoir. Everything just died. much for watching Unpacked with Rilip Khile Mamoja. Make sure you subscribe to my channel where you can get to watch more episodes. But more importantly, you can be part of our online community. Comment down below, share with us who you'd like to see on the show, what story you'd like us to discuss. We love engaging with you. Keep it coming and don't forget to subscribe.